So Alabama 26, Texas A&M 20. And us Aggies are in a hell of a lot of pain right now. It's a game that I, I know most of us probably feel the most dejected after more so than any other game in recent history. And I think the main reason for that is that us Aggies expected to win this game. At home, the way the defense had been trending, we felt good about Max Johnson, we felt good about this receiving core, we felt good about Le'Veon Moss and his emergence, felt really good about the pass rush, we knew there were some holes on this team, but we really didn't think Alabama was the team to exploit those holes. But it turns out, they were. Nick Saban pulled one out of the hat. Jalen Milrow had an extremely ballsy performance, exploiting that weakness in Texas A&M. And A&M missed Connor Wigman at times this game. It's just, it's just a fact. Max Johnson is a great quarterback. We're happy with him. But there's a little bit of a special factor that Connor has where he's just a split second ahead of most quarterbacks at the college level, at least in processing things, his release, reading a defense, and everything. And in a game that was this close, you missed that. But there's a lot to talk about this game. There's a lot of season left. I know we feel like this is the end of the world. After this game, it was always going to be one of two scenarios. Either A&M's on top of the SEC world, and this is Jimbo's chance. This is going to happen. Everyone be jumping on the A&M wagon. Or what ended up happening Jimbo on the hot seat again, get Jimbo out. This program is destined for failure. We're never going to get over the hump. It was always one of those two outcomes with this game. And of course, we got that non-ideal one. But like I said, there are positives to this team. There are things to look forward to. But of course, we're just going to be thinking what could have been. But we're going to do our best in moving forward. So thanks for being here. Like and subscribe if you like this kind of content. Let's talk some Aggie football. So it turns out Texas A&M was only as strong as its weakest link, and that weakest link being one-on-one -on -one coverage on the outside at the cornerback position. Everybody knew that Texas A&M was deficient at corner play. DeBerry playing out of position as an outside corner. He is clearly an inside guy, clearly a nickel slash star, maybe a safety. He's very physical. He's great on short routes. He's great on getting people on the ground, but obviously on one-on-one -on -one coverage, he can get beat, and he got beat time and time again by Burton this week. He got beat by Isaiah Bond. These guys were able to make plays on this team because they, Texas A&M doesn't have a lockdown corner. It's just a fact of this team. That's going to be a fact of this team for up through the rest of the year. A lot of teams you felt like weren't going to be able to exploit that because of Texas A&M's elite front seven. But what was very surprising this game was Milrow's ability just to do that. Milrow's ability to stand firm and not shell up after getting hit time and time again. His ability to continue to stand strong and make plays down the stretch. K.J. Jefferson last week looked dejected after he was getting hit time and time again. I would argue that Max Johnson this game looked dejected and started holding on to the ball too much because he was getting hit early in this game. And I would argue that those affect a quarterback's psyche and can really change the way a game goes. When the quarterback gets gun shy or starts making wrong decisions, maybe tucking too soon, maybe not hitting the guy where it's given because of the pressure. But Milrow stood firm. It didn't matter how many times AM sacked him in the first half. He was still going to complete the passes he needed to down the stretch to win this game. And some of those in the face of immense elite pressure. Because we know what AM's front seven is. It's probably the maybe the best front seven in college football. I think there's an argument to be made there. Alabama was a running team. They were known for their running attack. They were known for their threat of quarterback runs. But A&M totally shut that down, forced Alabama into a 30-yard running day, I believe. But yeah, it was just very unexpected to see Milrow and this receiving core have so much success because you thought that A&M would want to make them a passing team. You thought that that would be a winning situation for A&M. If Alabama wasn't able to run the ball, if Milrow was under constant duress, he was forced to make these deep down the, down the field throws with people in his face, but it ended up being successful for them. I know a lot of Bama fans will say that Jermaine Burton was in the midst of a career year, which got slowed down by an injury last week, and so we didn't really see it fresh coming into this game. But Burton showed some freaking good skills 
on this Texas A&M team. His contested catches, and of course A&M helped him with this, but he still went out and made those plays. Does A&M have more receivers like that down the stretch that they're going to have to play this year? Yes, LSU's going to have them. I don't know if Ole Miss or Tennessee is going to have anybody at that level, but they're definitely going to have chances to exploit this corner group just like Alabama did. On the other side of that coin, I felt like Max Johnson did get messed up from getting hit early in this game. I feel like he got he took some hits early in the game. They weren't all sacks, but he was throwing the ball and getting hit right after, getting slammed onto the ground. And then down the stretch, it really felt like Max was holding on the balls, not really seeing what was there, and kind of not helping his offensive line out by getting the ball out quicker. I know this is controversial, but I don't think the offensive line was a total failure this game. I think they got worn down, and on the last few drives of the game, yeah, they got beat up, especially the young right tackle getting blown by, getting pretty much dominated on that safety play that ended the game pretty much. There were running lanes to be had, especially on some third down conversions. Moss, Amari Daniels didn't have their best game finding what was given. And of course, the blocking wasn't perfect. You're going up against one of the best, maybe the best defense in the country. It's not going to be perfectly blocked every time. But I did feel like there were some lanes for these guys to squirt through that they're not seeing. Still a young running back group. Le'Veon Moss, clearly the best in my opinion. Amari Daniels had a really rough game, especially in pass pro. On that interception play, Amari Daniels pretty much whiffed. Max had a guy right in his face. Max throws the pick. And that was right after A&M's big turnover of their own. In that third quarter, you felt like A&M had a chance to really take control of that game. Up seven points. They had just sacked Milrow with a huge solo blindside sack by Cooper. He threw the pick the next play. At that point, you think maybe Milrow's going to start getting a little gun shy. He looked very out of it after that play initially. After he got hit and threw the pick, he just looked bad. He looked like he was hurting. Of course, you wonder what the pick does to a psyche. But AM turned the ball right back over, gave them new life. They weren't able to, you know, dwell on that defeat that they just experienced at the hands of that defense. They went out there and scored, and Milrow kept passing on this defense. Very impressive stuff by Jalen Milrow at that point in the game right there. Not to give up, but to hold firm. Something AM couldn't do under adversity. Alabama made the game-winning plays. Alabama made the championship-level plays. And I would argue that A&M played more not to lose. And those are just words. Those are just words that we use to make sense of what we just saw when I say not playing to win. Going into halftime, I felt like A&M could have tried to get aggressive there, risk some mistakes, but really capitalize on momentum that A&M had, try to get another three points on the board going into the half, when if you use your timeouts right. You can have 90 seconds on the clock to work with. A&M didn't go for it there. A&M not going for it in that punt situation in the third quarter where they had the ball at Alabama's 45 with one yard to go. You feel like you could go for it there and just try to buckle down and be aggressive and snatch this game away. You got to go out there and get the wins because Alabama made those plays. Alabama had those huge moments. Alabama had the field goal block near return. Alabama made the huge safety play late in the game. Alabama was getting the huge chunk plays in the air, making those courageous jump ball throws, throwing it up and just having faith in your receiver to come down with it. I don't think A&M played with their, excuse this phrase, with their nuts out. I think they played very, very much, or this game was coached very, very conservatively. I think Alabama played like, with big old cojones this game. And AM didn't. And I think that does fall back to coaching. You feel like AM got out coached this game. I'm not here to run Jimbo Fisher out of town. We'll talk about that come the bye week if we need to. I talked about it a couple of weeks ago. I'm not doing that right now. It's going to be up to this coaching staff to make sure that one loss doesn't turn into many. You have a lot to play for still. And if this thing goes the other way that's not successful and you start losing a bunch of games then you're really going to start feeling it. So right now, A&M has six very winnable games on the schedule. And you know when we use the word winnable, it's no guarantee there. You lose a lot of those winnable ones, like this game was winnable. 
but games where you're not going to be up against a defense like you just saw. Games where you're going to have a chance to capitalize like you did this game, settling for three again instead of getting in the end zone several times. It wasn't penalties this game. A&M wasn't the more penalized team. It was just not taking what was given, not capitalizing on the big moments of a game. You cleaned up the penalties, but then you couldn't get the yardage. You couldn't get that one yard you needed. It was the little things, and that's going to be on coaching to clean up. It's going to be on coaching to keep this team together going forward. We saw the video of Walter Nolan in tears after this game. How bad did you feel as a fan after this game? I was in the car heading to Houston after this game, and I was feeling almost tangible pain thinking about get this game, how close it was, what could have been. For the players, that's times 10. So it's, it's a huge project right now for these coaches to get this thing back on track hours after it just happened. Because it started today on Sunday. Getting this team back on track, getting the mindset right. It's the ultimate test for a coach right here. But this is another controversial, controversial statement. I think if A&M plays the same way they did versus Bama for most of that game, they can win a lot more games on this schedule. Mostly because you're not going to see a defense like that. And if you hold a team to 27, you feel like A&M has a chance to win most games. You don't make some of those miscues. You don't not take what's given on the running plays on third and short. You get a little bit more aggressive. You feel like A&M can win some games. The defense is good enough. That front seven is going to be there every single game. And of course, that hole in the corner group is always going to be there too. But your front seven is so good it's going to balance out. It's going to be up to this offense to go out there and make plays, not hang their heads. Max Johnson getting very frustrated with his offensive line. You don't like to see that kind of body language out there. It's going to be very critical adjusting between the ears going forward. This team needs to win nine games in the regular season, guys. It really does. You go eight and four, these talks aren't stopping. This feeling isn't stopping. Nine and three with a bowl win going into next year, you're feeling really good. Of course, what really sucks about this game, you lose it, you feel like you're not really in the running for the postseason anymore this year. I didn't predict A&M to have a playoff run this year, so that's cool, that's fine, but it sucks when it actually gets taken away from you, and that just happened. Of course, A&M really wanted this game even more because Alabama was a common opponent with Texas. It's undeniable that that was in the back of our minds this game. We wanted to have that bragging right, so for all those reasons, it really feels terrible. I'm worried about next week, guys. I'm very worried about this road trip to Tennessee. They were resting, watching this game, getting players back from injury over the last week on their bye week. Well, A&M just had a very physical, grueling game versus Bama. However, it looked like A&M came out of this team. It looked like A&M came out of this game healthy, so that's good. So it's up to the coaches to get this thing going. I don't know how you guys feel about that fact. It always is, but if they go in Tennessee, we're going to feel really good. I'm going to preview that game in a couple of days. Thanks for watching. I know this is a very negative video. I know we're not feeling good. It's a very difficult video for me to make. It took me a while to get through this one. I had to rewatch the game too, and that was not fun. But I appreciate you being here. Let me know how you're feeling after this game. I know we're not feeling good, but tell me what needs to be done. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. I appreciate you all. Gig'em.